Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm Marzia Hashimi. Well, a war like no other, where warfare is engaged via console in a comfortable chair like a video game, nice and safe and far away from the war zone. The operator simply pushing a button that can cause the end to people's lives all the way on the opposite side of the world. U.S. drone attacks are what we're talking about, which are defended by Washington, saying it is a safe way to fight terrorism. But the question is, safe for whom? As more and more Afghans, Pakistanis, and a growing number of Yemenis and Somalians lose their lives in U.S. drone attacks. Stay with us as we take a look at what the United States call collateral damage on this episode of the debate. The United States unsanctioned drone program comes under the microscope as the number of civilian casualties continues to rise. The UN finally announces a special investigation into the illegal drone attacks and targeted killings as Washington triples such attacks over the past year. Ben Emerson, UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights, announced a special inquiry on Thursday. The investigation will focus mainly on the extent of civilian casualties caused by drone strikes. Emerson will present his findings to the UN General Assembly later this year. The probe comes after Pakistan and two other unnamed countries, identified as permanent UN Security Council members, demanded an inquiry into the targeted killings. Islamabad has always condemned the deadly attacks, saying they violate the country's sovereignty and claim mainly civilian lives. Washington has argued over the past years that its unmanned aerial vehicles only target militants, but both official and unofficial reports have proved otherwise. The British Bureau of Investigative Journalism says U.S. drones have killed almost 900 civilians, including 176 children, since 2004. But other reports suggest that the number of civilian casualties is far higher. The U.S. has intensified its drone attacks in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Afghanistan since President Barack Obama came into office in 2009. A Washington-based think tank says U.S. drone strikes on Yemeni soil alone have tripled since 2011. Based on these estimates, Washington has carried out one drone attack on average every week in 2012. And such attacks are hitting Pakistani soil almost twice a week. The deadly drone strikes have stoked anti-American sentiment in targeted countries and triggered massive protests across Pakistan and Yemen. The strikes have made Obama, a Nobel Peace Laureate, a drone warrior in chief, with his army of aerial drones claiming lives almost on a daily basis. Well, I'd like to welcome my guest to the program uh, right here in Tehran, head of the I-14 News out of the UK, Dr. Hejaz Hossein. Out of London, former U.S. intelligence officer, Mr. Bob Ayers. And uh, from Islamabad, senior retired officer of the Pakistani Air Force, Sultan, Mr. Sultan M. Hali. Thank you all for being with us. Well, let's start it off right here in Tehran with uh, Dr. Hussein. Um, sir, who gave the right basically to the United States to be judge, jury and executioner for the international community? Now, international community is a very vague term these days. Whose server has got the powerful weapons in hands and uh, let alone uh, lack of complete uh, uh, you know, uh, character or conscience uh, if he's got uh, the weapons or the military power then can dominate and know there's no force in the world on the planet that can stop him. It's the gun, it's the rule of the gun that is dominating. Okay, well, let's switch over to London. What about that, uh, Mr. Ayers? It, it, it sounds like the old West. Uh, your take on all of this, does the United States have the right to deal with the drone attacks in the way that it does? These people that they're labeling as terrorists, do they not have the, the right to a trial? Well, I guess they have the, the same rights that people that are victims of car bombs or hostages that are taken in oil refineries have. The United States, when it uses drones, it's using a, a very minimal amount of force to go after what they perceive to be terrorists. Drone strikes, the motivation behind a drone strike is there is a human at the other end that believes he is targeting a terrorist, unlike car bombs that target civilians, unlike hostages that target the innocent. 
What about that, uh, Mr. Hanley, saying that basically drones, they're, they're targeting these people um, very different from car bombs. How different is it really if we see more and more, a, a growing amount of civilians that are being killed? Yeah, I'm afraid you are right, you see, because the perception is very different from Washington, from London, or from Islamabad, and even from Islamabad, it is not all that clear. In fact, the perception becomes clearer as you proceed towards the area where these drone strikes are taking place. Unfortunately, uh, I do not agree with the definition because first of all, who can define who is a terrorist and who is not? Because unfortunately, the what we call stat padding, which is used in video games, stat padding is being taking place because people who are able-bodied of a certain age, they are being classified as militants, they are being targeted. Yes, a certain number of militants have been killed, but in the bargain, a number of you see, innocent lives have been lost, which not only is a sad aspect, but the worst thing is that they have contributed towards terrorism because their relatives are being recruited by the terror mongers. They are being impressed upon the fact that, look, you got to take revenge for the cold-blooded murder of your families. And that is how terrorism is on the rise rather than on the decline. Well, uh, Dr. Hossein, what about that? Now, Washington, continues to claim that its uh, drone attacks are, quote, surgically precise targeted killing of terrorists. Your take on this definition by Washington. Now, that's a very crazy and paranoid uh, definition of terrorism. I would like to draw your attention, attention of the audience towards uh, a statement given by General uh, Stanley McChrystal, the former uh, head of the NATO ISAF military forces in Afghanistan. And he said two things. One, he said that uh, although the Americans have been able to uh, defeat uh, one section of the terrorists, two threats are there. So when the new threats, when the old threats, they recede, new threats emerge. So he further divulged that uh, as the terrorist attacks, they have been able to uh, help uh, the American strategy uh, towards uh, killing the terrorists. They, uh, the Americans have lost two strong cases. One, the Americans have added to and he said, added to manifold uh, the number and intensity of the anti-American people in the world, and uh, and not only the Muslims, but the non-Muslims as well. So the anti-American sentiments, they have been multiplied. And the second thing he said, that in the meantime, uh, the American national strategy has been completely jeopardized, and there is no way, way back. So obviously, I mean, I would like to draw another attention to a mundane Jurassic wisdom that when people, they say about the modern warfare, that don't heat your furnace to that degree of uh, making it an inferno, lest you should not uh, singe into it and get yourself incinerated. So the American, uh, the paranoid, mad, and crazy, uh, uh, you know, uh, video game players, they are sitting there in Creech, uh, a U.S. Air Force in Nevada desert, and they are killing civilians. So how can you justify not even a small boy, not even a child, uh, a civilian child is being killed? He does not have a religion. He does not have any subscription to any terrorist activity or terrorist body. He is a child, innocent, and you have killed a very meticulous and very, uh, you know, very meticulous statistics, they say, that... Uh, so far, more than 180 children they have been killed alone in Pakistan. But the figure which I compile, since I belong to that part of the world in Pakistan, so more than 360 small innocent children, they have been killed in Pakistan alone. How okay. can you justify killing of innocent children? All right, what about that, Mr. Ayers? Uh, what amount, how many people uh, have to be killed before they can get out of this definition of collateral damage? That seems to be a term that is readily used now by the United States. Um, as our guest in Tehran has just talked about, the number of kids, and of course we don't have accurate figures on the numbers who have been killed, but we know that many civilians have been killed in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, now growingly also in Yemen and Somalia. How can Washington justify uh, killing innocent individuals? Well, let's, let's take your question and break it down into some basic component parts. Uh, the first part we'll address, as you said, civilians have died. Well, I'm not sure how you differentiate a dead terrorist from a dead civilian. 
Terrorists don't carry ID cards that say I'm a terrorist. They don't wear uniforms that say I'm a terrorist. So how can They're you kill them? Between a how dead can you kill them if you're not sure, sir? If, when you see someone who is armed and you see people that are armed moving in groups, those are legitimate targets in a combat zone. Now, if the terrorists or the armed terrorists choose to do as their philosophy tells them, which is to immerse themselves in the civilian population, they are the ones that are putting civilians at jeopardy because they are putting them on the same target that the terrorists are. That's why they occupy schools, that's why they occupy mosques, because they know if those targets are struck, there will be civilian damage, and that will further inflame anti-U.S. sentiment. You have to assign a lot of this blame to the terrorists themselves because they are immersing themselves in the local population and they're putting the local population in jeopardy because they're being targeted. What about that, Mr. Hawley? So it's the fault of those on the ground, he's saying, not the ones who's shooting the drones out of the Nevada desert. Your perspective, Mr. Hawley. Yeah, uh, you see, uh, it can be debated both ways. Unfortunately, it is a fact that uh, the terrorists, they seek refuge in uh, places which are otherwise taboo, like uh, schools, like hospitals, like uh, you know, houses where women and children are, and they perhaps also use women and children as uh, human shields. But the fact is that that does not justify Washington or the CIA to target those places especially knowing that it is going to cause collateral damage. I mean, if you recall that only recently there was this shootout in this U.S. school at Shandy, and President Obama, he shed tears in front of the live audience on the television. But this particular uh, spectacle was taken with a pinch of salt in Pakistan because people are asking that what about the innocent children and women and old persons who are killed like this. The important thing is that yes, there is a war on terror going on and terrorism is a very serious menace, but that does not provide the excuse that the uh, solution to this is to improve the intelligence and to make sure that only the terrorists are targeted. Now the question here arises also that even after a shootout or after a so-called a successful strike, there is no way to really verify where a certain militant or a certain number of militants have been killed because what to talk of DNA samples or what my friend in London was saying that a terrorist is a terrorist. The important thing is that nobody can go there and physically go and identify who were the terrorists and who were the collateral damage or innocent civilians. So therefore, we cannot justify this at all and some other means will have to be found to fight and continue this war on terror. Well, let's look at that, a continuation of the war on terror. Let's look at Afghanistan, uh, Dr. Hussein, specifically, that we have seen now an increasing amount of attacks uh, in Afghanistan. But, of course, now the U.S. has an exit plan, that they're planning on leaving that country. When they leave, um, do you think that they will leave altogether, or will we see an expansion then of the drones over, uh, over Afghan skies? I'm, I'm shocked to learn. It's so diabolical. The mandarins of security and foreign policy formulation in the Pentagon and in the State Department, they don't take into account that as they are leaving that area. Now, in, in one side, they are portraying and they're preaching the Americans, uh, you know, defense spending would be cut by, by uh, say, uh, about uh, $1 trillion in the next 10 years, having said that, about $100 billion per year. Now, they say they would reduce their defense budget. Uh, but in the meantime, the Congress, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, approved another $6 billion to manufacture uh, the state-of-the-art, the third version of the American uh, uh, drones called the MQX and which will be uh, you know which would would have the the the, the more lethal uh, like stinger weapons and they would be able to uh, kill a uh, ten times larger number of civilians as compared to uh, the, uh, the the Reaper and the predators so how how more is enough for them how far they will go and they will keep on adding to the list of their enemies and the time will come they will implode into that 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 furnace they are they are doing now this is the time the our americans they revisited their policy they should come back to the negotiating tables like i mean as they are leaving you know uh, the afghanistan war theater in about 
uh, six to 12 months from now. So this is a time for them to leave a legacy, but not like the Vietnam of 1960s and 1970s or the 1950s legacy of, uh, of the Korea. So they, ha they will have to leave a legacy in Afghanistan so that th these are the people, the Americans themselves, they will have to defeat the, the, the menace of uh, terrorism and that by negotiation, by dialogue and by parleys, not by killing one, one person and to create other people to revenge Americans. So uh, it's, it's good to, good to uh, have uh, uh, more amicable solutions uh, than to have more Sylvester Stallone uh, style uh, solutions. Okay, well let, let me get uh, some of the, our Facebook messages uh, that uh, our viewers have sent in. We have uh, Mr. Hossein Jafar. He asks the question, are these drones designed to target Muslims and to divide them uh, between good and bad Muslims? I, I want to ask that question actually of uh, Bob Ayers. Uh, your take, sir. It, it seems that in certain places, the same individuals that are called terrorists in one place, actually then the United States support in other places, it, is this, let, let's uh, go to our, our viewers' question. Is it targeted to sort of divide between good Muslim, bad Muslim, or, or tell me the overall goal? And do you think that it has been effective, as our guests were talking about, as we can see, for example, in Afghanistan, that the situation has just become uh, perhaps even worse with more and more people now having anti-American sentiments than before the invasion 11 years ago? First of all, I don't see how you can define a good Muslim versus a bad Muslim. That's subjective, that's a value judgment. It has nothing to do with the problem that we're discussing, which is drones used in a combat operation. Now, we also have to remember that drones are employed over areas in which the central government of the nation state itself is unable to enforce the law. These are lawless regions that are beyond state control. That's why the drones are flying there, because the state government and state security forces, whether they be Pakistan or Afghanistan, they cannot control those areas. So you have to assume that if there are combatants in areas that are not controlled and they're supporting cross-border operations, they are legitimate military targets. It has nothing to do with whether they're a good Muslim or a bad Muslim. They're combatants in a combat zone. They're targets. Okay, well, what, what about the fact that uh, though children have been killed, women have been killed, because you said it's hard to differentiate a terrorist, uh, an armed terrorist or not. But what about that, Mr. Ayers, when we do have statistics on children being killed? Who okay, should, who that, should a, answer for their deaths? Well, that's, that's a, a reasonable question. Uh, I repeat what I said earlier. We have to examine the motivation behind a drone strike. The intellect, the individual that is launching a drone strike, believes he is striking combatants. He is targeting what he believes to be legitimate military targets. If there is collateral damage, it is unintentional. That is entirely different than a car bomber who intentionally targets innocents, intentionally targets women and children, intentionally targets people Isn't in the crime, marketplace. Isn't a crime a uh, crime, Mr. Ayers? Isn't it against the uh, Geneva Convention? Isn't this basically terrorism by another name? Or does it depend no, on who Geneva, commits the, the act? The Geneva Convention does not make bombing a criminal activity. Bombing is a legitimate part of warfare. One thing that you might want to refer to if you're going to talk about the Geneva Convention is that the Geneva Convention requires, mandates, all combatants must wear uniforms. What about so the, the terrorists children? Themselves We're looking at the children. What about the Geneva Convention and the protection of children? This is the question, who, the who should be responsible for the deaths of more and more children in these countries? Are they collateral the damage? The wrapping themselves with well, of course they're collateral damage. They're collateral damage because the terrorists are using women, children, and civil areas as human shields. They're trying to hide behind women. They're trying to hide behind children. And when they lose a child or they lose a woman because of, quote, collateral damage, you're blaming the Americans for it, not the terrorists who are using these people as human shields. Get your blame straight. 
Well, I guess it depends on uh, where you point the finger because it's, it's like the chicken of the egg, which comes first, because perhaps if the drones weren't there, then they wouldn't be hiding. But let me turn to Mr. Mr. Hadley and your perspective on this. Your take on what Mr. Ayers is, is saying, sir. I beg your pardon, if, if you're talking your to me, take, please repeat the question. Your take on what your take on what Mr. Ayers is saying? He's basically saying that the United oh. States does not have any blame. The central governments have asked them to come in, and it's the terrorists that, that are hiding behind these civilians, and that's why you have people dying. No, I'm, I'm afraid this is taking a very myopic view of the whole situation. And these are human lives we are playing with, and they should not be trifled with. To start with, uh, he mentioned the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention is very clear that weapons cannot be used in an area which, against which no war has been declared. The United States is conducting a war in Afghanistan that is understandable, that is perhaps with UN sanction, although UN sanction came later and the attack came first. But in Pakistan, Pakistan has not been declared to be a war zone, nor is the United States at war with Pakistan. So therefore, the Geneva Convention is very clear on it, and any collateral damage or any other damage is a clear violation of the Geneva Convention. Okay. Now the second part, that whether these people are being used uh, deliberately, so therefore it is justified. No, I'm afraid not, because if the same situation were to take place in Washington or in any other city of the United States, they would think 500 times before attacking a building or a location where the terrorists were hiding and where there was a danger of losing even one single innocent life. So are the lives in Pakistan or Afghanistan cheaper than the lives in Washington? I'm afraid not. All right, on that note, I'm sorry we are out of time, but I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Hejaz Hussein out of Tehran, head of uh, um, 4 News, I4 News in UK, Mr. Bob Ayers out of London, former U.S. intelligence officer, and Mr. Sultan Hali out of Islamabad, senior retired officer of the Pakistani Air Force. Thank you all for being with us, and thank you, viewers, for staying tuned to us right here at the debate. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow. I'm Marzia Hashimi signing out for myself and all the crew right here in Tehran. Thank you so much, and goodbye.